big boxer motor. Dirt bike style front fender. Shaft drive. Very, very red saddle. Howdy, this is Lemmy with Revzilla, and by that description, you might guess that I was on an old airhead, maybe an R80GS. But as the title of this video already told you, I'm not. Instead, I'm on the latest member of the R9T family, the BMW R9T Urban GS. Like I said, that's the last member of the family, but as far as I'm concerned, it could be the most practical, and I'm gonna show you why in this video. But before we start talking about the R9T and its stable mates too much, let's rewind for just a second. We'll talk about that original R80 GS. Now, a lot of you probably know that that is the motorcycle that most credit with kicking off the ADV craze. It was a big, heavy street bike, but it was still light enough to have a little bit of prowess off the road as well. Now, the Urban GS, of course, is not an adventure bike. Instead, this harkens back to that early prototypical type of an adventure bike. So the R80 GS, the bike that once saved BMW Motorrad, is being called upon once again to put some money in the BMW coffers. Only nowadays, this bike is nostalgic, not really novel. You see, BMW is going after younger buyers, and younger buyers right now are looking for bikes with retro flair, and they also want lots of utility. Bang for the buck is super important. This is a great move on BMW's part. While this might not be the most expensive bike in the world, it is the type of bike that can create a lifelong customer, thus making a younger consumer something very desirable for a company like BMW. Now we're gonna take this baby out on the road and I'm gonna show you how the Urban GS actually comports itself. I'm gonna get my gear on while I'm doing that. Make sure you click that subscribe button so you can check out all the videos we're making here at RevZilla.com. Whether it's a bike review like this one or Anthony or Spurge is walking you through a parts or gear breakdown, or perhaps you're checking out one of our how-to videos showing you how to maintain or modify your motorcycle, we've got a little something for everyone. Right now though, let's get out on the road. Okay, the first thing we should talk about on these bikes, being that they are a family of bikes, is that the R9T Urban GS is not its own separate model. It's part of a family. BMW doesn't really try to hide that fact, nor will I. So if you're considering one of these bikes, I would recommend you take a peek at some of our other reviews. Spurge and I have spent a lot of time in these. Those of you guys who watch our reviews may remember Spurge spent time on the Scrambler. I took a little bit of time on that bike too. I also was out there riding the Pure as well as the Racer. and some themes started to develop because these bikes are all very similar. So if you're looking at one of these bikes, check out some of those reviews as well. They'll probably be helpful to you. But one thing that Spurge and I think can both agree on is this motor. This motor's an absolute peach in here. It's probably the cheapest way into a big boxer. And this, this thing just has so much punch. It's very playful. It'll lift the front wheel right off the ground very easily. It's peppier, I think, than most people think. Um, you know, and you can hear it farting away behind me. It's just got this glorious honk to it, announcing to everybody that you're riding a BMW. So speaking of that glorious honk, if you listen, this thing has a single exhaust on it. Now I first saw this on the Racer and the Pure, fell in love with this pipe, it sounds so good. It's one of the differences between this bike and the Scrambler. The Scrambler has that higher pipe, dual outlet, a little bit different. This could be the best sounding OEM exhaust I've ever heard. It sounds just as good, if not better, than an aftermarket piece. It's one thing I think the BMW just nailed. They just, they, they hit it out of the park on the exhaust here. Now moving on to the suspension. The suspension on these bikes is really all the same with the exception of vr 9 t the original. That one obviously is a little bit different, but all the other bikes have a little lower spec component. We have a non-adjustable front end. We have a uh, preload only adjustable in the rear, about five inches of travel at both ends. And this bike is fairly softly sprung, especially for somebody my size or even Spurgey size. All the same though, I think it actually works here. So hear me out, this bike's supposed to go off road. You need travel, you need softer springs to help soak up the, you know, the teeth clickers, the potholes, the bumps, the roots, the rocks. And I think actually soft suspension works totally on this bike. Now similarly, let's move on to the brakes. This is another item where BMW saved a little bit of money. I've heard a bunch of griping and gnashing and teeth. Oh, they're not the Brembo monoblocks. You don't need Brembo monoblocks in this bike. These are still Brembo brakes, they're dual discs. They stop the bike in a hurry. Um, you know, all of the lower spec models where BMW is able to save a little bit of money for the ultimate buyer of this bike, this is, these are good choices. They work well. This is a very cogent, holistic bike. So don't be put off by that at all. Now the thing that I was most eager to sort of try out, to test on this, was actually the, the handling. When I jumped on the Scrambler when Spurgeon had it, I couldn't believe how slow and sluggish the front end felt. I think he had some similar feelings. 
And, uh, you know, we didn't really know what to chalk that up to. And after having ridden this bike, talked to some other people, I'm pretty sure it's the tires. The Scrambler wore a set of Carews on it. Uh, those tires just didn't seem to jive well with that bike. This bike either comes with a set of Metzler Torrance Necks, which are almost entirely street-based, or you can also grab yourself a no-cost option from BMW, and those are a set of Continental TKC80s. That's what I have on this bike right now. Personally, I don't know that I love either one of those tires. I'd probably choose one of them and burn off a set, and then I'd probably move into something like a TKC70 that sort of shoots the difference between those tires. I think the bike could feel a little bit more planted on the road, but also still be able to exploit its off-road abilities just a little bit as well. Speaking of which, I did take this thing off-road a little bit. I brought it onto some beautifully groomed two-track. Uh, I also took it down some gravel roads. This bike did absolutely wonderful. It was a bunch of fun for a couple of reasons. First, off-road, this thing is easy to turn the ABS off. It's just one touch on a button over here. Very simple. Um, and then couple that up with the fact that you do have all this power on tap, over 100 horsepower, you can get that rear wheel sliding around like nobody's business. But you know, nobody's gonna mistake this for a full on dirt bike, especially the first time you either go down or have to turn the bike around. This thing's a little lardy in terms of off-road machinery. But I think anybody who's looking at an Urban GS has done their research, they've done their homework, they understand this bike's capabilities and its limitations, and I think you're gonna treat the bike accordingly. Now for the money that the, you know, the BMW is asking for this bike to, I gotta be honest, I wanna see some more stuff. I wanted to see a gear indicator. I wanted to see a tachometer. I wanted some adjustability, um, at least in terms of preload for the front suspension. Um, you know, this bike's considerably more expensive than the Pure, and I think that buyers should get a little bit more for their money. That having been said, the whole package is really good. This is just a very rideable, capable bike. Now I'm gonna round this review out with a thought that is tough, but it's also true. BMW did not break any new ground with the R9T Urban GS. This is an amalgamation of similar models we've seen in their past and the present. However, they don't really need to break any new ground here. When we consider the retro or throwback category, there've been all too many times we've seen a manufacturer trade usability for uniqueness. And I gotta be honest, if you're not gonna be out there riding your bike all the time, smiling your ass off, there's not really much point in having a motorcycle now, is there? Now for $13,000, BMW is probably at the north end of what they could ask out of this motorcycle. But still, I feel like that price is very representative of what this motorcycle is capable of. It's a no-frills bike, but it handles a variety of situations very deftly and very adroitly. Sure, the spec sheet's not gonna knock anyone's socks off, but this is also a motorcycle that makes me super duper happy every time I put my keister in the saddle. And for me, that could be the most important measure of a motorcycle. Now, if you think back to the beginning of this review, you'll remember that I had said that BMW created the R9T line specifically to hook newer, younger customers. And I think that's gonna be a very good move for them. In a time when profitability is considered really at point of sale and not thought about much thereafter, BMW is kind of bucking the trend here. Instead of thinking about profits in terms of quarters, I think when they consider the R9T line, they're gonna assess the profitability of this bike in terms of decades. They're investing in motorcyclists. Always a good idea when you're selling motorcycles. Now I had plenty more to say about the Urban GS, but you're gonna have to read about them in my Common Tread article. Be sure to check out some of the other articles we have too on other members of the R9T family. And be sure to subscribe to us so you can catch the related videos as well. I really just wanna get out and ride this bike a little bit more, so I'm gonna do it. I'm Lemmy, I'm outta here.